I just wanted to create a quick tutorial to show how to use MEGA to do alignment and phylogenetic analysis. So here I've got a faster file containing sequences that I've downloaded from a database. In this case, it's from the NCBI, and these are hemagglutinin sequences from H5N8, and I've taken a sample. So I haven't got all of the sequences because otherwise that would be too large a file and it would take too long to do the demonstration. I've already downloaded and installed Mega X, so that's why it's already showing that any file that finishes .fas is associated to Mega. So if I double click on it, then Mega will open it. So in Mega X, it's different very different in appearance uh, to Mega 7 in terms of the colouring and the layout of the icons and the way it's set up and also actually the text formatting. So if you look here at the sequences, these are coding uh, DNA sequences. Uh, pretty much they're already aligned, but there's one or two that are not aligned properly and they get out of alignment further on, but we'll worry about that in a second. So if you're going to do a phylogenetic analysis, which is an analysis of the evolution of a set of sequences, the first thing you need to do is align them. So in Mega, you need to go to alignment and you can choose two different built-in programs. You can have ClustLW or you can have Muscle. Now, ClustLW has been updated and replaced first by ClustLX and now by Clustal Omega. It is not a very good system. It is slow and doesn't give great results. Muscle gives better results, but it's ideally optimized for protein. Uh, there are other programs you could have used and aligned outside Mega and then just read the alignment in, but we'll use Align by Muscle. As this is coding region and we've got you can see here the start codon ATG and three stars above it means every single one of the sequences in this set has the start codon. So we can do alignment using muscle and codons. So what it will do is take the sequence, convert it into the protein sequence, align the protein sequence and then convert it back again. This is faster than trying to align the DNA itself. Uh, so I've picked alignment, but I hadn't picked any sequences. So it says, do you want to pick everything? And I go, okay, yes, please. Uh, these are the default settings for running muscle. If you know that there's something special happening, then uh, you can change these settings. If not, I would really strongly suggest leaving them as they are and press okay. It will remove any gaps if this is a previously aligned uh, set of sequences from a different program. Now there aren't any gaps here at the minute, but that's fine. It can remove them anyway. It's gone, done the alignment and finished. Now before one of the sequences near the top uh, got out of alignment as you went through the sequence, you saw a sort of jagged thing. Now when your sequences are properly aligned, you see a lot of stars at the top. So the stars tell you that you have the same nucleotide in that position all the way down through all of the sequences. So here you can see one sequence that is quite different to all the others there, which is from Colorado. Uh, most of the others are very similar. And this one has a very big deletion. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is nine bases, so that's reasonable. Deletions must be in groups of three because otherwise you change the reading frame for the rest of the sequences. So you can see that all along that sequence, that one is quite different to all the others. So you would expect that one to be very separated from the others when you construct a phylogenetic tree. I'm trying to see if there are any other sequences that seem that stand out. There's one down here which is a bit different. There's a few that have a few differences, but this is the really big difference. So if I want to do phylogenetic analysis, what do I do? I go to data and I click on phylogenetic analysis. Is this a protein coding sequence? Yes, it is. You can do phylogenetic analysis just on 
the untranslated regions, so regulatory regions or inter also intergene regions. But this is protein coding region. So once you've done that, you'll see that in the second window of Mega, a few more windows arrive. I quite like the TA window because this shows you all the positions where there's some kind of differences. So as a lot of the positions all have stars on them. They're all identical in all the different sequences. But where there are differences, these are highlighted. So in some it's A, in some it's G. So this allows you to see how many uh, nucleotide positions are different between the sequences. So you have that one Colorado sequence which is different in lots of places but most of them are only different in one or two uh, nucleotides and there's large parts of it where there's almost no differences at all so here there's a difference from an A to a G which is identical in the Colorado one whereas it's different in another place so again all that information will be used to construct the phylogenetic tree now in this second window of MEGA, what I want to do is calculate the phylogeny. So I click on phylogeny. Now there are multiple methods you can use for creating a tree. There's maximum likelihood, neighbor joining, minimum evolution, UPGMA, uh, maximum parsimony. Now UPGMA is the easiest to understand, but a poor method uh, and not usually used. Uh, maximum parsimony is a very extensive method and quite an old-fashioned method and also probably not used that often these days. Same with neighbor joining and minimum evolution. So most people these days use maximum likelihood as the preferred method. So if I click on maximum likelihood, it then asks me which data do I wish to use. Do I wish to use the data that's currently active? Yes, I do. Now, this is how you set up your calculation for your maximum likelihood tree. Method, maximum likelihood. You want to test how well your phylogeny is working. So this is called bootstrap. That's the only method they have of testing. You can switch that to none, in which case you'll get a tree very quickly. Or bootstrap method means it will repeat the tree calculation however many times you say here. So this has said 50, which is probably the minimum that it goes to. Some people use as a rule of thumb that the number of bootstraps should be the number of sequences. In this case, it's less than 50, so 50 is fine. Um, some people say it should be the square of the number of sequences. Some people say lots of different things. If they actually read the textbook by the person who invented the bootstrap, they would know that it should be the square root of the number of sequences. So you're incredibly unlikely to need to use more than 50 or in extreme circumstances, 100 bootstraps, because that would be an alignment which contained 10,000 sequences. So don't worry about it, 50 is fine. What kind of model is it? It's nucleotide. Now here, you can pick different evolutionary models. So the simplest one is Duke's Cantor, which means there's one probability for changing A to C to T to G. It's a terrible model and shouldn't be used. Then there's the Kimura two parameter model, which has a different um, rate of change between <coughs> transversions and so purine to purine and pyrimidine to pyrimidine is against purine to pyrimidine. Then you can get more complicated models. You have Tamura three parameter. So instead of having two different probabilities, it has three. Then you have Hasegawa, Kishino, Yano, Tamura, Ni, and general time reversible. General time reversible has a different probability of A to T, A to C, A to G, and also G to A, G to C, G to T. So all of the different possible changes have different probabilities and they are not uh, symmetrical in the two different directions. So it's the most complicated model, but it requires a very large amount of data for you to work out all the different probabilities. Tamura Ni is the default because Tamura Ni wrote Mega. 
The next thing you have is something which says rate amongst sites. So you know within the codons that the first and second positions and particularly the second position of the codon does not change as often as the third position. So instead of having equal probability of every single nucleotide, what you want to have is lower probability, lowest probability, slightly higher probability in triplets as you go through the sequence. And this is called the gamma distributed uh, rate of sites. So you can leave that as gamma distributed with invariance. So that means some sites that don't change. And uh, this is just a mathematical thing for fitting it. So that's all fine. Uh, leave all the rest because you don't need to know about it. It's got four threads on this particular computer because I have to have four threads that I can use. A quad core computer you use four. Um, if you had an eight core computer you could use eight. It just makes it a bit faster. It's not particularly important. Press OK. It will then calculate the tree. So what it does is first creates a single maximum likelihood tree and then it goes through the process of bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is taking all of those sequences that have been used to create your tree, randomly shuffling the columns of them around and then calculating new trees for each of these random shufflings of columns. This means that in theory you get to see which uh, parts of the tree are always found whichever order of columns you have. So this is a test of consistency. It's a test of precision of your tree. So it's done eight. So I'm going to pause this recording until it's finished doing its job. So when it finishes, it will give you this uh, image. It will open up another window which contains the phylogenetic tree. So in this case, it's a pretty boring phylogenetic tree because most of the sequences are closely related to one another. As I said, there's that one from Colorado which is very different to the others and though, so comes out on this separate branch. There's a small group here which are a different branch to the others. These are from uh, the Czech Republic, Go Chang and uh, Korea, another by Caltiel. And then there are these other sequences uh, from Baikal Teal in California, Oregon, Korea, all over the place. Now, remember I talked about the bootstrap? So this, these numbers on the branches, are the percentage of times where that pair of sequences split from one another and are neighbours. So if it says 93%, then this split between these groups of sequences occurs in 93% of the trees, 99%, 83% and so on. You prefer your bootstraps to be quite high. Here you've got one which is 38% and that usually means that all these sequences are so similar to each other that it's struggling to find enough signal to distinguish between each of the different groups. When you've got viral sequences like this, then you end up quite often with low bootstraps because you've got very few changes. If you're looking at very large scale evolution, so you're looking at something like sequences from chimpanzees, apes and so on, then this will give you a much clearer tree and the bootstrap values will be much higher. As well as displaying it like that, you can construct look at the bootstrap consensus tree which spreads it out a bit or well, clearly so you can see the bootstrap numbers so here you can see some very low numbers indeed so twos so very small probabilities but the original tree shows you the actual distances in terms of uh, nucleotide changes so this is the tree that you want to report with the numbers on it